Welcome to a <clears throat> snowy Monday water board meeting, uh, Monday, April 19th of 2021. Um, to begin, can we go ahead and start with the roll call, Heather? Sure. Todd Williams? Here. Allison Gould? Here. Kathy Peterson? Here. Scott Holwick? Here. Roger Lang? Here. Ken Hewson? Here. Nelson Tipton? Here. Uh, Wes Lowry. Here. Kevin Bowden. Here. Francie Jaffe. Here. Uh, Jason Elkins. Here. David Bell. And here. And Heather McIntyre is here. Council Member Martin is not here yet. Okay. Thank you, Heather. Um, next item is approval of the previous month's minutes. Is um, everybody reviewed the March 15th, 2020 uh, meeting minutes? Is there any comments? Otherwise, we need a motion um, to approve the March 15th, 2021 meeting minutes. So moved. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Kathy is the second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. The meeting minutes are approved. Item four is the water status report. Nelson? Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. So, um, I'll give that real quick. I'm trying to figure out how to put the packet where I could see it with so anybody else could access it. So, I got that done. Uh, so, the flow in the St. Brain Creek at the Lions Gates today is uh, 75 CFS. Um, the, with the 124 year historic average of approximately 95 CFS for this date. The call in the same rain is Highland Reservoir number three. And the admin number is 11,642. Uh, with a uh, priority date of 11-15-1881. Uh, call on the main stem of the South Platte River is uh, Tremont Ditch, and the admin number is 50,769, with a priority date of 12-31-1988. Ralph Price Reservoir at Button Rock Preserve is, is uh, approximately 88.8% full, and at 6,391.5 feet. And full is 6,400 feet. And it's at 14,300 and approximately 14,376 um, acre feet, down approximately 1,800 acre foot. Um, from, so, so we're leasing around 75 CFS currently. Uh, Union Reservoir is at an elevation of approximately 20 feet, which is 28 feet is full and it's down approximately 5,300 acre feet and we're releasing seven CFS currently. So the, the upper Colorado River Basin snowpack um, for today actually on April uh, 19th is at 76%. Um, normal peak date for the upper Colorado River Basin is April 10th. South Platte uh, Basin snowpack is at 96%. Normal peak date is April 26th. So we still have a couple weeks on the South Platte. We get this snowstorm, maybe we can make it to 100%. Nice. So uh, any questions? Any questions for Nelson? Mm -hmm. I've actually got a couple, Nelson. Um, sure, Todd, go ahead. So I know we talked last few months that you were going to try to maybe move some water, I believe, down into Union. And yes. Then um, exchange maybe other supplies back up into Button Rock. Is that still going on or what? what so, you so mentioned seven CFS coming out of Union. How much is coming in? Just kind of curious what the plan is for this spring. Sure, Todd. I can go over that. So, um, about on April 4th, we started releasing um, water from Ralph Price Reservoir, and it was the Cloven Basin change decree. And uh, we're probably we, we're releasing about 25 CFS. So we're roughly, when I do the numbers, we're roughly getting about 
anywhere between 20 and 25 CFS into Union Reservoir. Um, so, and that, in, and then, and of course, release, release in about 14 acre, seven CFS, 14 acre feet. And so we're gonna try and run that Clover Basin through the uh, month of April. And then we'll, uh, water resources, we'll get together and we'll take a look and see if there's any other opportunities to uh, move other decrees from Ralph Rice Reservoir to Union. But we'll, we'll take a look at it first. But our goal is to keep running and we're running about 25 CFS if I wasn't clear. And we're going down the oligarchy ditch. And so we'll reevaluate that at the end of this month. So on May 1st, Todd, does that answer your question? Right. So you've got about, you're getting about 30, somewhere around 35, 36 acre foot a day. Somewhere Net between 30 and 35 acre feet, feet, correct. Okay. All right. So you're moving as much as you can to try to fill Union sure. in advance and then, sure. okay, then fill and Button Rock. At a later and just point. remember, we're, we're about 15 miles of uh, oligarchy ditch. There's about 50 mile, 15 miles of ditch. So. But, we, right. but we do get a little, when we get storms, that really helps because we get some uh, storm drainages in, in there too. So, but, uh, but we've okay. been pretty consistent the last, the last two weeks, we've been pretty, pretty consistent. About and then the how's the overall, time. how's the storage content maybe as a percent average on the same brain? Do you know that? You know, I just, you know what? I just opened that up. Um, I don't, uh, to this morning, I don't remember off the top of my head. Wes, do you, you know what it is off the top of your head, the same brain? Storage? I can open it up real quick there, Todd. It doesn't take nothing to find it. When you can talk, you may be talking about that more as far as a drought plan. So Actually, if you're going to hit God, that, I West, can... you can do it at that point if you want. Sure, but I could find it if you need me to. Why don't we, we can, Wes, if you want to hit that on the drought plan, that's fine. Okay. Okay. All right. Anything else? Um, any other questions for Nelson on that? All right. We'll keep moving here. Um, uh, next item is public invited to be heard in special presentations. Heather, uh, there's no public invited to be heard. Is that correct? That's correct. We have no one with us today. Okay. And Ken, any special presentations today? No special presentations. Okay. Just All an right. item of note. We do have council member Martin with us now as well. Great. Well, welcome council member Martin. Glad you could make it. Um, so next item, we're on to item six, agenda revisions and submission of documents. Anything there, Ken? I have none. Okay. So after many meetings with no development activity, Wes is making up for lost time here and Item seven under development activity, we have one, two, three, four, five, six items. Um, I believe you're gonna do the first four. You'll go over those and then um, we'll ask for, I guess we can do those together in terms of a motion and a second in terms of recommending those for approval to council. Is that right, Wes? Yeah, so I'll, I'd like to go through the first four with water board. You can make one recommendation on those four. Then I'll go through the fifth one because I have some a little more additional information I'd like to share with you on that. The last one is just information item, but I can I'll add a little more context to it as well. Okay, why don't you go ahead and um, go ahead and get started with the River Town annexation? So the River Town annexation is a twenty one point four acre parcel. It's located south of Saint Brain Creek and west of Sunset Street, so kind of over by uh, Isaac Walton Pond area. Um, there were no historical water rights pertinent to this annexation. Riverton uh, annexation will be in compliance with the raw water requirement policy um, at time of final plat with uh, satisfaction of the 64.44 acre foot raw water deficit. So this is a um, development that's being developed by Riverton uh, Longmont LLC. It's a uh, 320 multifamily unit uh, residential property is what they're looking to do um, with 14 attached duplex units and then 20,000 square feet of commercial office and flex space. So um, that's all I have on that one. If, there's, if you have any questions on that one, I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise, I'll go ahead and jump to the second one. Any questions for Wes on that? Yeah, uh, River Town annexation. Go Wes ahead, Roger. Yeah, Roger. You, when when you go over these, the next uh, three or the total for 
Can you just cover how they're going to meet their uh, uh, water requirements? Just cover that briefly. Okay, sure, yeah. Usually at annexation level, um, we really don't have much, uh, much information on that. At Platt, sometimes we do. Um, um, but if, as I have information about those, I will share that definitely with water board. Okay. All right. Allison. I, I just didn't see. So I was wondering what stage they were in. So if you can let us know down the road, that'd be fine. You bet. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Um, similar question to Rogers and that is whether or not there's any information regarding stormwater at this point. Uh, so, um, as part of the development review process, um, our stormwater for folks review that. That's outside of water resources purview, but there is a stormwater management uh, component that is being looked at for these. Um, I don't have that in front of me right now. If it's something of interest on a particular development, I could probably uh, share that with you though. Uh, this one in particular seemed like, given its location, it might be in flood zone mm -hmm. um, and have some potential, I don't know, impacts to the to that area. So I was just particularly curious. Okay. Marcia, did you have some? Yes, actually, it's a similar question to Allison's. Um, because uh, we're getting some, some resident comments saying, yeah, this is too close to our water resources, too close to our nature preserves. And so stormwater is one question, is this going to be, you know, changing the, the flow in, into the lake and riparian areas? Um, and uh, uh, so anything you know along that lines positive or negative would be good and otherwise a clue as to um, who, who I should uh, ask about that um, would be good. You probably know who else is on the review team. Yeah, so although I don't have it right in front of me, I can definitely get that and share that with you. I know that um, we have a stormwater engineer that reviews all annexations and all plats for uh, <laughs> complying with all the standards uh, for stormwater. And uh, I just don't know the specifics of what those are, but I'd be happy to look into that and share that with you guys. Yeah, and, and just send an email be maybe before the council meeting because somebody will probably speak. Um, so I would very much, <laughs> very much appreciate that, Wes. And, uh, and, and thanks, I'll let you go on. Oh, and Heather, sorry, I didn't know the chat was off limits. That's okay, thank you. Usually it's turned off, but we had a different meeting that was able to use it, so I didn't get it turned off again. So with that, I'll go to the, uh, the next one, item 7B, Sandstone Ranch Apartments, final plat. That's a final plat of 36.79 acres, uh, located south of State Highway 119 and east of Weld County Road 1. It's a final plat of a portion of Sandstone West Conveyance Plat that the Water Board reviewed back in 2007. It was also part of the Maida annexation from 1998. Um, the all raw water uh, requirements pertinent to Sandstone Ranch Apartments were previously satisfied as part of the Sandstone West Conveyance Plat. So Sandstone Ranch Apartments final plat is presently in compliance with the raw water requirement policy. Um, what's being contemplated here is a 276 unit apartment complex. Um, I do know that um, anybody that's visited that Walmart, they've noticed there's a lot of prairie dogs out there. I think they estimate somewhere between uh, 1,200 and 1,600 prairie dogs out there. They're working with Dan Wolford and the city of Longmont and working through the uh, prairie dog management plan. So um, those will be addressed as part of this. And that's really all I have on that, unless there's other questions. Are there any questions on um, uh, this project? I'm not seeing any, Wes, why don't you keep going? Okay. Next one, item 7C, Quell Commercial Center Filing 1, final plat. 
It's a 13.194 acre parcel located north of Quail Road and east of State Highway 287. So just uh, immediately west of the Walmart Museum. Um, included in that 13 acres is a 4.994 acre parcel that'll be transferred uh, into city ownership to be used for future municipal purposes. Those are more, most likely gonna be for uh, additional parking for the museum and possible campus expansion. Um, after application of the historic water rights, the total raw water deficits are pertinent to Quell Commercial Center filing one final plat is 4.10 acre feet, and it'll be in compliance upon that satisfaction. There, this particular plat includes four uh, lots. Um, one of those lots will is proposed to have a four-story, 86-room hotel with uh, an office building, um, maybe a small drive-through coffee shop, and I think that's all I've got on that. Unless there's some questions. Questions on this project? One, I assume Left Hand Creek goes through this property, Wes? It's bounded by the, on, on the uh, north. Okay, I guess maybe there'd be similar kind of questions or concerns with regards to the stormwater or the floodplain on that. Marsha, looks like you have your hand up on that. Um, yes, Todd. Um, sorry, I am eating lunch. Um, the I've been watching that because again, this this one is a letter generator, it being being close to the creek, and uh, for a while under under the the projects under construction uh, map, um, there was a plat that um, uh, went into the into the setback area. And then I looked again and it was withdrawn. And then I looked again and it was even off the withdrawn list. So have they reworked it or um, do, you, do you have any idea what's going on with that? Because they apparently are, uh, are going through some kind of rework on the project. Yeah, there's been um, on, that, on that particular project, there's been um, several riparian setback variance requests. They've been working through with, with the planning department on that. Um, again, water resources focus on these is primarily with application of the raw water requirement policy. So I haven't specifically been involved in those setback variances. Um, but what I can do is as part of that um, um, request, I can uh, get you in contact with the project planner or planner, I can email their information and they would best be able to answer where they're at with that in terms of going back and forth and so forth. Appreciate it very much. Okay, any further questions? All right, um, why don't you keep going, Wes? Okay, um, and let's see. Riverton, Sandstone. Commercial and Harvin, uh, Hover Junction, final plat. It's a 16.824 acre parcel generally located south of Highway 119 and west of Hover Street. All historic water rights were transferred to the city at time of annexation. The full acreage is subject to the full requirements of the raw water policy. The total raw water deficit for Harvest Junction final plat is 29.089 acre feet, and it will be in compliance with the city's raw water requirement policy at time of that satisfaction. Uh, this particular one is a and part of a mixed uh, use employment zoning. Um, they're contemplating a little over 6,000 square foot commercial space, kind of a neighborhood type commercial uh, aspect with 236 single family attached dwellings on 36 buildings. So you're looking at condos, townhomes, things of that nature. So this property has been looked at multiple times Um in the, in the last 30 years. Um, but David Brewer, the uh, property manager, believes that they're gonna be able to uh, make something happen. So that's what I have on that one, unless there's some questions. Any questions on that project? I am not seeing any. So Wes, what, what you need is, unless there's, we can break any out individually, but 
if um, if not, we need a recommendation for um, items A through D, um, a recommendation to council of approval of the raw water um, calculation. Is that correct, Wes? Correct. Okay. Someone want to make that motion? Also move. Okay. We have a motion. Is there a second? I'll second that, Todd. All right, we have a motion by Allison and a second by Scott. Any further discussion? I'm not seeing any. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, that, those through four are approved. Um, okay, Wes, you're gonna go on to the next item? Yes. So the next I item is Erwin Thomas Final Plat. Erwin Thomas Final Plat. It's a 48.81 acre parcel located south of Colorado State Highway 119 and west of North 119th Street. It's part of the Irwin Thomas Annexation Number no. 1 that was annexed uh, in 2017. All historic water rights, which included 34 shares of bonus, were transferred at time of annexation. The full 48.81 acres are subject to the full requirements of the raw water requirement policy. Um, Irwin Thomas final plat will be in compliance with the city's raw water requirement policy upon satisfaction of the 48.81 acre foot deficit at time of final plat approval. So um, with that, this plat is like any other plat that came before water board. Um, however, this plat has um, a couple uh, unique nuances. Um, and I wanted to give you a little bit of, of uh, context and history uh, on that. Um, so, as you got, as you may recall, back in uh, November and December, uh, late last year, City Council, through Ordinance O twenty twenty sixty two, entered into a three party public private partnership agreement. They call it a P three agreement with Diamond G Concrete Company, which is Reggie Golden, and Costco Wholesales Corporation. So you probably have seen, seen it in the Times call, pretty big deal. Um, the execution of that P3 agreement init uh, initiated the land development review process. That's what got us here today. Um, the plat includes essentially six lots. One, 17 acre lot for Costco warehouse and fueling station, one nine acre lot for city affordable housing purposes, and the balance of the four lots to be held by the current landowner. Um, of those four lots, three are commercial lots and one is a residential lot. So the completion of that process is anticipated to occur mid 2021 and would include full satisfaction of the city's raw water requirement policy. Uh, water resource staff is anticipating the raw water deficit pertinent to the Irwin Thomas final plat to be satisfied by payment of cash in lieu of water rights received and application of credit from the 1200 acre foot of water identified and Longmont's water demand evaluation. More specifically, economic development incentive and Longmont's affordable housing program that was contemplated in table 20 or table 22 of that plan. So um, water resources is, crea is creating a tracking sheet. So if you recall, there was 1200 acre feet that was identified in the, raw, in the um, uh, water demand evaluation. And of that, we carved out 400 acre feet um, for um, um, economic development, or I'm sorry, for um, uh, affordable housing. So we, um, and, and Water Board had that conversation with staff um, back in, I think it was 2018 and 2019, and then city council on, acted on that accordingly. So we're gonna break those out. So um, um, I, well, let me finish and, and I'm gonna kind of jump back here. Uh, Longmont uh, plans to plans to create what's known as a Harvest Junction East Special Review, uh, or sorry, a Harvest Junction East Special Revenue Fund 
and use monies from that fund as well as from its affordable housing fund to pay the cash in lieu fee. The money for these funds will originate from a loan from the city's fleet fund, which ultimately will be repaid from collection of sales tax revenues generated from Costco sales. So when it's all said and done, the cash and lieu fund will realize approximately $450,000 and there will be an applied incentive credit of approximately 23 acre feet. And that's how, that's how this deficit is gonna get satisfied. So with that being said, later this summer, Water Resources staff will bring back to Water Board as a development activity information item specific related to final compliance of the city's raw water requirement policy for this development. So in other words, what you're acting now on now is the calculation for that, the total deficit associated with this plat. And then after it's completed, after the deficits are satisfied, we plan to come back to you and discuss the details of how that was satisfied, that being a cash and loo component, and then the credit that Water Board had already approved through the water demand evaluation. And there's two parts of that. That's the building incentive. That's what we use to entice Costco to come into Longmont, as well as our affordable housing lot, that nine acre lot. So there's, there's some extra things that are going through this, all of which, if you wanted to really get into the details, there's a 10 page con uh, council communication from December 1st, 2020, that you can look at that has a lot of the details of it as well as about a 46 page uh, ordinance and agreement on how, how that all shakes out. But I think what's important for Water Board um, is to understand that there is a deficit and it is gonna get satisfied um, through cash in lieu and then through that credit of that carve out from the water demand evaluation. So I'm now ready to try to answer questions that you may have on this. All right. Uh, Roger, it looks like you're first about here. Yeah, what I, I'm I'm trying to understand items like affordable housing. Does that positively impact the uh, the cash in lieu amount that we end up receiving? I mean, do they does it lower the cash in lieu amount? I'm I'm not sure I understand that completely. So I think with um, what was what was decided was that, um, I, I'm, I'm gonna use my own terms, as part of the global negotiations to, for the current landowner and to have Costco, there was gonna, uh, part of that was going to include affordable housing. And the, so basically if you wanted one thing, you had to have everything. So the affordable housing is, we're going to essentially the cash and lieu fund will get a check for the full amount. It'll be a cash and lieu check that'll cover the entire 48.81 acre foot deficit. But then a part of that cash and lieu fund will be reimbursed to the affordable housing fund. And when that happens, then what we're going to do is start tracking a debit, if you will, from the 1200 acre foot of credit that we've that the water demand evaluation identified as being available for these types of things. So um, you might think of it as the, the uh, drought, or I'm sorry, the cash and lieu fund not getting monies for the affordable housing or for the Costco, but it's being satisfied for that carve out that was set up through the water demand evaluation. And so, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of how that's gonna work. Complicated. It's very complicated, and that's that's why you no. Know, well, you remember. I mean, nothing seems simple anymore. But these council, con I mean, the 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 communication that was put out there back in December um, did a really good job trying to detail how everything's going to work, and a lot of it goes beyond uh, the raw water requirement policy. And I think it, it. So I tried to just pull out those pertinent parts that related to the raw water requirement policy, but um, as you read that, and as you would have read in the Times call, it's expected that the sales tax generated from this from Costco is going to cover the city's expenses in just over three years. And so 
um, the powers that be above us, city council, city manager, and others um, believed it to be that it was in Longmont's best interest to entice city to Costco to come into Longmont. And this was all part of that uh, kind of enticement package. Okay. The only one other comment, Todd, maybe uh, Heather could get us that city council information somehow, just shoot it to us on a, an email so we can grind through that and we can comprehend it a little better. Yep. Sure, Heather, is that possible? Yes, we can do that. Okay, that'd be good. Mm -hmm. um, any other questions? I've got a couple if I don't see anybody else with their hand up right now. So, Wes, um, as I understand it, so they'll they'll pay the full cash in lieu and then they have performance requirements both on the, the um, affordable housing as well as Costco before, you know, they're going to be able to get the rebate essentially from the, the um, <clears throat> cash and lieu fund. So that that's number one. Number two, the they've already dedicated or they've already satisfied the direct flow component. Um, <clears throat> good job, Wes. I was afraid you were going to get mauled there. So that, that's <laughs> I apologize. No, that's fine. I, I get it. Um, so they've already satisfied their direct flow component of the raw water requirement. So when, when the cash and loop comes back to them, if they satisfy their obligations, are they going to get satisfied up to the three acre foot per acre at cash and loo, even though they're only paying cash and loo at the one acre foot, the storage deficit? I mean, how does that work? No, we're only speaking to the remaining raw water deficit. It's only the, the direct flow component, the two acre foot, that's done and satisfied with transfer of the historic 34 shares of Beckwith. So all that's being, um, so essentially, if, as you read through this council communication, basically a loan is gonna be taken out through this, the, um, the fleet fund. And the fleet fund is gonna pay the full cash in lieu amount. So from a different city account is going to pay for cash in lieu. And for all intents and purposes, that's all water resources really concerns itself with. Now, the greater city is concerned with other things, the flea fund and stuff. But the idea is that it'll come and fully satisfy this deficit. Therefore, it's in compliance with the raw water requirement policy. But furthermore, as part of the Longmont Municipal Code, there's a, there's a um, section in the Longmont Municipal Code um, and I believe it's chapter 4.79 on, re, on reduction in subsidies that we speaks to um, there being a method for the housing uh, fund to be reimbursed and then also for, um, for Costco to be reimbursed. It's part of that incentive. And so um, the, so what will remain, if you will, is the money for four of the six lots. It will not include that lot that was Costco and it will not include the affordable housing lot. Um, those will be satisfied through that carve out. So any future plats, not this one, but future ones that have an economic building incentive would be the same way. There would be satisfaction of the deficits, meeting the compliance with the raw water requirement policy. And then there would maybe be a subsidy or a reimbursement back to someone that would would cover that that particular part, but it would debit again from that 1,200 acre feet. Just start whittling down from that 1,200 acre feet. So I get that, Wes. So in this case, the Costco lot 17 acres, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. And they've satisfied two of the three acre foot of raw water requirement. So the they have a one acre foot per acre. So what's going to happen is they're going to pay cash in lieu for the one acre foot per acre for the 17 acres. Yes. And then if, if they meet their terms and conditions of the agreement, um, that one, that 17 acre feet or one acre foot per acre times the 17 um, acres is going to be essentially rebated back to them as part of this reimbursement agreement. What, what I'm trying to make sure is so in your tracking spreadsheet, and I, I think that's a great idea. I, <laughs> I think we need to have a way to monitor this is kind of the charge of the water board to make sure we mm -hmm. have adequate supplies going mm -hmm. forward. So we need to know how much of that, that allocation for affordable housing and economic incentives is being allocated so we can track mm -hmm. that. But 
in God, with regards to Costco, so 17 acre feet um, would be the potential cash and lieu essentially rebate. The, you know, I guess what it'd be the 34 acre feet that they've already dedicated, that's staying. That's correct. So when you have a line in the tracking spreadsheet for Costco, it would say up to 17 acre feet would be rebated if they meet their terms and conditions, right? Correct. So okay. that's exact. That's exactly right. And I think in the actual, if you went to the ordinance that was attached to the council comp, it spells it out to the dollar, how much they would get, assuming cash and lieu doesn't change. I mean, it's, it's very detailed of specific performance for all this. And everything, and so I think we I think we have a, a very clear picture. It's just this is the really what brought this is making this one most unique. Is this is the first time we're implementing that uh, building incentive component from the water demand evaluation that we've talked about years ago. Okay. All right. Um, are there other questions that the board has, Roger? You have another. Yeah, ahead, not to beat this, but Wes, as far as uh, meeting their contractual incentives, Costco, is, is that time bonded? Like, do they have to do that over a five-year yeah. period, or do you know anything about that, or how long a period is it's that? It's very specific, after? yes. That's correct, Roger. Um, they do have very specific dates that things they have to build by a certain date. I think it's by 2024. Um, and all the details of that are found within that ordinance, um, that was attached to the council con. So maybe when, uh, when Heather sends it out, she can additionally send you the, the ordinance as well. And you'd be free to look through all the D again. I think the ordinance was 46 pages long and the, and the council con was about 10. So almost 60 pages, but a lot of detail. And if you are interested and take the time to read it, I think they, the staff that put that together, primarily Harold Dell, Jim Golden, and Eugene May, they did a pretty good job of articulating what's going to go on and what's required and the timing of all that. Okay, thanks, Wes. Are there so other questions? Yeah. Wes, one, one other thing. So they're going to pay the cash in lieu, and then are you going to come back to the water board at some point when we know that their obligations have been satisfied and you'll confirm that with us and we'll know okay at that point the 17 acre feet for example for Costco and whatever the specific number is for the affordable housing has officially been kind of designated to those uses that'll happen you know I guess at a future time once they've met all their requirements. So when the applicant which the applicant is Reggie Golden on behalf of Diamond G uh, Concrete Company. When he, when that, um, when the um, P3 agreement is finalized at that time, then they'll they will finalize and pay the cash in lieu, which right now is anticipated to be the sometime around July or August. As soon as that happens, the very next water board meeting, I'll come in front of water board as an information item. And I'll, and I'll detail how much cash in lieu was paid. It'll essentially be the, the requirement acreage times the current fee for cash in lieu of water rights received. And then I'll break out the part that was for affordable housing and the part that was commercial development incentive. And I'll show those through a tracking form that we have that'll show a debit for each of those categories. And then as we get future uh, development applications that have either of those components, we'll just keep breaking those out. So we're trying to make this um, as trackable as possible and as simple as possible, but it's just, there's a whole lot of global negotiation that went into making this happen. And so I was trying, you know, I'm trying to pull out just the nuggets that pertain to the raw water requirement policy. And that's what I've given you. But I think if you're wanting a more colorful, mosaic of what's going on again i would i would recommend checking out that prior council com and and ordinance so so you'll come whatever it is july or august show us the calculation go ahead and deduct it from you know or add it to your tracking spreadsheet i guess what i'm bringing up is it may be a year or two before we know whether they fully satisfy their obligations um, no. if they don't you know namely if they don't 
build Costco within the time frame as Roger mentioned, or they don't build the amount of affordable housing, then they would have to, I guess at that point, um, the amount that um, the cash in lieu that they paid that doesn't get rebated or, you know, there'd be a adjustment at that point, right? So they satisfy all the deficits that has to occur in order for them to start moving dirt. So then the idea is that after they start moving dirt, the owner will put in the infrastructure so that then Costco can come and start going, um, start growing up the, and I don't remember the specifics on timing that it will, that's allowed for Costco to generate sales tax revenue. That's being expected as part of this. Um, but um, I think what I'm hearing you say is if Costco, so Costco's not going to build um, unless they satisfy this, uh, the raw water deficits. And if they build, um, then, then they've, there's nothing else to, I don't think to, to worry about, except possibly they don't perform it, you know, they, but I can't, I, their projections are based upon their, and it speaks to this in the council column. They looked at what they've, you know, produced in sales for superior location and Thornton location and out and so on and so forth. And, and I don't know, I think it said they're expected to be done, uh, to satisfy, our sales projections within just over three years. And I, it feels like there was a trigger that it would have to happen within five years, but the things that would unravel, um, I think the, the tentacles go way beyond the raw water requirement policy. So yes, water resources is going to have to stay, stay abreast of what's going on and stay in the loop with the planning department and the, and so forth. But um I think the bottom line is they've, you know, they've satisfied it. If it changes, then what it would mean to change to a different use, if it's not Costco, if it's not affordable housing, then those deficits um, would probably then be reapplied. So in other words, if there's a, if the affordable housing nine acre lot became just a traditional residential, then in order for that nine acres to develop, then we're going to require satisfaction of the one acre foot per acre on that lot. But the nine acres lot is actually, as I understand it, is going to be owned by the city of Longmont. So I would think we would know if we don't develop it, that we, if we sold it, that that would be the trigger. So there's a, um, so yeah, there's going to be a lot, a lot of stuff that we're going to have to pay attention to. We'll do our part in tracking the deficit um, that's pulling from the credit, from the carve out of the water demand evaluation. And then if, if, uh, if it ever goes away from affordable housing or if Costco doesn't perform, then we'll have to, it'll have to be looped back in for the, for then future uses to satisfy any deficits that would be pertinent to it. And, and Todd, if I could just give you a little more specifics on that. So today's action will allow the final plat to be uh, moved forward uh, and the, the payment for the raw water deficit completed. And then the current schedule calls for a closing on all the property in, in July of this summer. And so between now and July, this def the deficit has to be paid because at closing, is when the credit back to the development developer will occur. And then once that occurs, then all the closing on the property can occur. And then there's a July, 2024 um, deadline for Costco to have their store open, uh, generating revenue. And then, and then that agreement has a really good clawback provision if those two dates are not met. Okay, that helps. Thank you for those explanations. Is there any further questions on this? Otherwise, we need a, um, a motion for approval um, or recommendation to council, I should say, of the um, Irwin Thomas final plat um, water dedication. 
the water calculation. Kathy, are you making the motion? I'll make that motion. All right, we have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll, I'll also second this motion too. Okay, we have a second by Scott. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carries. And it sounds like, Wes, this last one is just for information only. So if you want to go ahead and take that one. So the Longmont Church of Christ minor subdivision is a 2.44 acre parcel located south of 14th Avenue and west of Collier Street. Um, it's part of an annexation that, that annexed prior to the formation of Longmont Water Board. Um, and therefore, according to the city's Longmont requirement policy for lands that annexed prior to the creation of Water Board, um, transfer the historic water rights um, satisfy the policy unless there was a previously um, specified written agreement. And there is none for this property. So Longmont Church of Christ minor subdivision plat is presently in compliance with the city's raw water requirement policy. They're planning to do like a two-story church addition and, and building a, a single family home in the, uh, in the area that'll be for, I think, for one of the pastors. So since it's already in compliance and because it's, there's no further deficits and because it's before Longmont Water Board, it's an information item only for you guys. Okay. Thank you. Um, any questions on that one? I don't see any. Okay. Um, with that, thank you, Wes, for, for those. Now we're on to general business and looks like you're up against again, Wes, under the 2021 water supply and demand management plan. I am. So the, uh, what you have before you is the 2021 and 2022 water supply and drought management plan. The purpose of the plan is to manage the city's water supply and anticipate, identify and respond to drought in the St. Brain Creek watershed area. Um, I thought I would walk through just um, a few of the uh, uh, highlights of the plan. It's, it's very similar to uh, plans Water Board has seen in the past. Um, so um, the, uh, the City of Longmont's raw water drought supply policy is outlined in the raw water, uh, raw water master plan. Um, I apologize. Let, let me, uh, you guys are probably hearing some background noise. Give me just one second to take care of that. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. I don't know where you guys are at, but it is snowing hard where I'm at right now. So looks like I'm in a snow globe. Yeah, I'm just getting started to snow pretty good here too. Good. Let's turn white. Wes, I did mute you. So if you want to unmute again. Great. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, so the... Uh, uh, I'm just going to highlight um, some of the uh, parts of the water supply and drought management plan. Um, Heather, if you could pull up that uh, part, I think it's page 23 of the board's packet. Um, I was just going to kind of walk through some of these. Okay. So I'm just gonna hit some of the, a couple of sentences and paragraphs and walk through this. Uh, the city of Longmont's raw water drought supply policy, again, is outlined in the raw water master plan. Uh, it describes the city's policy of using a one in a hundred year drought recurrence interval as the basis of the planning for the city's raw water supply. And the drought interval is based upon a drought of approximately seven years in length. We like to highlight that because many cities only use a one in a 50 year drought and some of them only use a one in, or a three year or even a five year uh, drought length. And so we have a much broader uh, scope in our, in our uh, policy. 
Um, on the third paragraph, during 2020, the St. Vrain River Basin experienced slightly above average stream flow conditions as a result of above average snowpack and average rainfall. As a result of the above average stream flow during 2020, Longmont finished the 2020 irrigation season with average storage in its local reservoirs at 70%. Uh, current projections are that by July 15th, 2021, select reservoir storage will be 95% or full. So you were asking Todd about some of the um, reservoirs and where we stand. Um, um, and I, I apologize, I didn't pull it up currently, but based upon where Button Rock and Union um, are currently, uh, based upon our uh, projected uh, yields on our water supply and uh, on our um, uh, change cases, we're expecting that those reservoirs will be full or near full and that um, uh, Highland system, which makes up the the, main, uh, the remaining bulk of the deficit will be there. Hey, hey Wes and, and, and Todd. So on March 31st, I looked up on our state water commissioner's uh, report and as March 31st, it was, or April 1, it was uh, roughly 62% roughly for local basin storage. So, and what we wanna keep in mind on that, so the, um, we're kind of specific in ours when we talk about select reservoir storage. So there's there's a lot of reservoirs out there that um, are irrigation only reservoirs, many of which are junior uh, reservoirs. And so what we're looking at in terms of our water supply and drought management plan are um, reservoirs such as Button Rock, McCall, Birch Lake, McIntosh and Union as being the ones that would really impact Longmont's water supplies. So, um, so I guess that's an important distinction when we're talking about the reservoirs. I don't know that all reservoirs in the basin will be in, in total 95%, but certainly the ones that would affect our water supply and drought management plan, we expect to be nearly full at the end of this runoff season in mid-July. So um, then down below, we have a kind of a, a table, kind of comparing 2020 and 2021. So in 2020, the total water supply available was just over 24,000 acre feet. In 2021, we're expecting a little over 26,000 acre feet of available supply. And we'll talk a little bit more of that in detail when we look at table A. And then our total treated water demand last year was just about 17,500. We're looking at about a 2% increase in demand this year for 17,835 acre feet. Now the snowpack, which is another indicator that we pay attention to on April 9th when we produce this packet, South Platte was at 92%, Colorado at 79%. Um, as of today, as Nelson mentioned, I believe South Platte was at 96 and Colorado was at 76. With the snow you guys were talking about, we think there's a good chance that it's probably going to go to 100%, which is, which is good. On the next page, um, we have a number of, of description of indicators and forecast methods that we use. The Natural Resource Conservation Service's monthly stream flow forecast. That's a forecast tool that we use and it's integral into our water rights change cases. It speaks to what our um, what we predict is going to be the flow at lines, and then therefore how our decrees will perform. We it's a wide range and average and in an average condition, and that's what we're expecting this year is what would be termed as an average runoff. Next is the Natural Resource Conservation Service's monthly snowpack survey. Those are those. Um, what we just got done talking about that we think with this storm um, is probably going to push the St. Rain Basin uh, closer to 100% of average, hopefully. We're looking at St. Rain 
uh, Creek Basin Reservoir Storage. I, I just spoke to that and some of the reservoirs, the, the most important of which is Ralph Price Reservoir, but certainly those others play a significant factor. Again, just as a reminder, it's, it's gonna be Union, uh, McCall Lake, um, Oligarchy Reservoir number one, otherwise known as Birch Lake and uh, McIntosh Reservoir. Then we looked at our we look at our Trans Mountain water supplies. That's CBT. It's carryover from the prior year. It's Upper Baldwin Ditch replacement water carryover. Any exchange CBT supplies that we got, and for this 2021 year, um, those Trans Basin water supplies by themselves are expected to yield about 18,500 acre feet of water. Uh, we also look at raw water available uh, availability for the city of Longmont. Um, our city of Longmont treated water demands. Right now we're predicting a 2% increase from last year. Um, we will see. Um, and then lastly, the call, uh, city of Longmont's water supply projections for multi-year uh, multi projections. And that's part of our table A that I'll go over in just a minute. So those are the indicators. Uh, and, so next are the descriptions of the drought supply response levels. Basically, if the combination of supply and available storage exceeds projected demands by more than 135%, the city's water supply will not be considered in a drought scenario. So that means we would be in what, what is uh, classified as a sustainable conservation level. At the sustainable conservation level, the city will continue to implement best management practices to conserve the water resources of the city. Uh, this level will include a projection um, of the following indicators, storage volume in Ralph Price Reservoir greater than target levels for level one. We'll, I'll, I'll go over that with you here in just a minute on table B. And that our raw water supply availability projections for the current and next water year are at a level greater than 135% of projected water demand. If, um, if those aren't satisfied, we go into what's a level one, which is a moderately, which would moderately impact the city's supply uh, versus demand. That's when our raw water supply availability is between 120 and 135% of projected water demand. The next level is a level two, which would severely impact the city's supply versus demand. That's when our raw water supplies are at a level of 105 to 120 percent of projected water demand. And then lastly, on the top of the next page, level three would critically impact the city's supplies. And that's when our raw water supplies available um, are less than 100, 105 percent of projected water demand. That means we we still should be able to meet our demands, but that's barely all we could do. And so um, the next section is a description of drought response action plans. So I just wanted to mainly look at the sustainable conservation level because that's where we're at currently. And that's where the data is suggesting will be next year. So we're gonna continue public information concerning the impacts to the city of Longmont's water supply to encourage the best management practices are followed and the city will continually promote a public water conservation campaign. The, uh, the voluntary measures are gonna be parks and rec, golf course and school district are gonna be encouraged to follow best management practices and conserve water where possible. That the city owned facilities will strive to set the benchmark for water use practices. And that we're gonna encourage all customers served by Longmont Water Utilities to implement best management practices for total water use. Um, level one drought project, uh, uh, projections, you find on the next page uh, that we're going to, if, if we were to get to that level, we would voluntarily encourage all customers served by the Longmont Water Utilities to implement a 10% reduction in water use from historic levels and that irrigation class tap customers may be required to reduce demand by 10%. And that community garden users, as well as private garden users, will be encouraged to implement a 10% reduction in water use from historical levels. 
The mandatory measures would be parks and rec, golf course and school district uh, would result in a net 10% reduction in historical use, uh, annual use, and that all other municipal water uses will be reduced by 10%. So building use, fire department, et cetera. Um, so that's, that's kind of it for uh, level one. And they, they, we do make a note that union reservoir water levels would be lower than normal, resulting in lowered ability to conduct late season recreational activities on a reservoir. It should be noted that under sustainable conservation level, the way we're managing the union reservoir and integrating that into our um, water use activities, that even under water conservation or sustainable conservation levels, union reservoirs may still be low. This just says lower than normal. And if, if anybody has paid attention to union the last several years, you, you recognize that it goes up and it goes down. And that's just how it's how it's used. But level one says it may be lower than normal. Um, the, the, if, it, if we were to go to a level two drought, it's basically a mandatory 20 to 90% water reduction for uh, parks and rec, golf course and school districts, depending on the severity of the drought. Um, and level three, that's basically, everyone's gonna have to really cut back, you know, possibly completely eliminating outdoor watering and some of those things, but that's, not even on the radar for this year. Um, again, that would take 105% of supply to demand um, for this year and next year. And we're, we're not anywhere near that. So, but it does speak to that if, if and when we were to get there. So if we move, uh, continue to move forward in the packet to table A, I just wanted to highlight some of the more specific water rights that make up our actual and projected water rights yields. Um, so I'm just going to kind of go through them a little bit, kind of quick. Um, I think a lot of them are somewhat self-explanatory. I think the important part to take away from this is kind of the final total numbers. But um, again, CBT quota, that was um, set on the 9th of this month by the Northern Board at 70%. Last year, it was at 80%. Um, usually, it's pretty safe to always think that they're going to issue at least 50%. And that's what we projected for 22 and 2023, 20, respectively. Um, number two are direct flow water rights. Those are a list of about oh, 20, 15 to 20 different water rights. It's our upper transfers, lower transfers, 2000 change cases, things like that. Um, we're predict, uh, projecting uh, just over 4,000 acre feet of raw water available from those. Um, and last year it was uh, about that same amount. The reason that number, 4,000, is less than what's projected in 2022 or 2023 is we're planning to take those. Uh, direct flow water rights. So as some of you may understand, when you get issued a, uh, our water rights through our change case, we can put them for direct flow or for storage use. Um, we are gonna take some of these water rights and put them into storage. So we're gonna take a lot of those water rights that could be used for direct flow, but we're going to choose to put those into Button Rock and into Union in order to fill those reservoirs uh, to the extent that we still have other water rights remaining to satisfy our deficits. And so that's why those numbers are, are kind of different. Our 29 transfer decrees, those are decrees that were from 1929. Uh, primarily, they relate to the Longmont Supply and Palmerton decree. And so our projected available demand from those this year is 1,079 acre feet. The pipeline decrees, we have, we have decrees for our north and south pipeline. And we're projecting uh, the raw water available from those to be 973 acre feet. Uh, next is transferred reservoir storage decrees. Those are decrees that are available to be used to meet treated water demand. For example, Pleasant Valley decree, union reservoir changed rights and so forth. And the yield from those um, 
is is eleven thousand six hundred. I'm sorry, eleven 1 hundred and sixty three acre feet. The next is reservoir storage available for release. This, this for the most part speaks to button rock and, and it speaks to our design drought and it speaks to how much water would be available if we were to experience a one in a hundred year drought over seven year duration in that first year. Um, it's expected and we believe it to be true this year that we could pull out 4,222 acre feet. And uh, when, it, when the year is over, it can change, but that's what we're predicting at this point. Trans Basin water rights. Again, I spoke to it. We're 18,585 acre feet. It's CBT, Windy Gap. It's our XL water exchange. Um, it's Upper Baldwin and our carryover water. So slightly more than last year, primarily because of Windy Gap. Um, we've already been using Windy Gap. We used it um, when we were doing our Button Rock uh, Outlet Works project. Um, we believe that Windy Gap will pump some this year. Um, and so what we had to do in order to get the Windy Gap water thus far is we had to collateralize CBT. So as Windy Gap gets pumped, that collateral CBT will come back to us. And, and when it does, that's going to, that kind of makes up that difference from last year to this year. Um, we're always striving to carry over a full carryover of 2,825 acre feet. That's the, that's the amount that's needed in order to, to uh, yield our 20% carryover. So that's something that we've, we just always try to have happen. It then puts us in the best situation for next year because we can then get that carryover for the following year. And then we have a thousand acre feet for water rental and leases. And those numbers fluctuate a little bit, but they're fairly consistent. Um, school district makes up um, a, a good part of that, um, but we have a number of other, other uses. So the total projected supply is 26,248 acre feet. When you look at that compared to the demand, which is again, is 2% higher than the previous year, it shows the percent of supply versus demand at a sustainable conservation level to be 147%. And as you'll recall, we talked about it needed to be greater than 135% for to be in a sustainable conservation level for that year and next year. Next year's projection also taking an, an additional 2% increase in the in the demand um, would put us at 139%. We actually go to another year, 2023, and even doing that, again, another 2% increase in demand, we're still at 135%. So um, there's that. And then we, then the other thing we do is we look at how much water we have available to, um, in our storage vessels that are, of, available to be used municipally. And when you look at that, again, it's Button Rock, it's, it's, it's Birch Lake and, and Union primarily. Um, the number of months available to meet those is about 21 months. So if we didn't get any snow melt and we didn't have the, the St. Vrain River completely shut off, the reservoirs themselves, themselves basically would have enough to meet our demands for somewhere around 21 months. Um, so kind of paying attention to that. The next page looks at table B um, and it speaks specific to Ralph Price Reservoir Storage. That's our workhorse. That's where we get our water in the winter. Um, it says that for the first year in a design drought at a sustainable conservation level, it needs to be at greater than 90% of storage. So as of April 9th, we were at 92% of, of full. We're projecting by July 15th, it'll be 100% full. And so therefore it'll be greater than 90% at the sustainable conservation level. So um, we've additionally included the city council communication uh, draft of, of that that we'll be taking to city council in May. And we've also included the city of Longmont's guiding water principles. Uh, those are always good to, um, to look at and to, to review. So with that, 
that's our presentation on the 2021-2022 water supply and drought management plan. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to try to answer them for you. Great. Thank you, Wes. Um, Allison, looks like you have a question. Yeah, thank you very much, Wes, for walking us through that. That was really interesting and very detailed. A um, couple questions. Uh, what is the downstream call that affects the uh, direct flow rates primarily? So, um, so, so we there's a call in the river that's set by the water commissioners in different reaches. So the District Five uh, water commissioner she'll set a call for the Saint Brain Creek, and that would be like today the call is Highland Reservoir number three, and it diverts at Highland Ditch Headgate up by Lyons. So the call that she makes affects from that headgate diversion upstream, and then the call downstream affects anything from, from that point down. And why that becomes somewhat significant is sometimes you can have a, a difference in call. You could have a maybe a senior call on the St. Brain Creek and a really junior call on the South Platte River. And any flows that accrue to St. Brain Creek below the call on the St. Brain Creek could be potentially eligible to be used, for example, captured and pumped into Union Reservoir. Um, that's probably the easiest one to think of, that there could be some water that um, is available at our pumping station, um, kind of there about right around um, Dick's Sporting Goods and the wastewater treatment plant. Um, there's occasions where there's water available there that we could turn on our pumps and pump it to, through the lower end of the oligarchy ditch and get it into Union that then could be used for other purposes. So that's where, that's primarily where that lower call would affect Longmont. Does that ever create a, a situation where the river's being swept? Yeah, say that again, I'm sorry? Is there ever a, a complete dry up or do they sweep the, the system? So the, the state, has a real analytical approach at looking at a zero point or a dry up on the river. So they look at water supply readings at Lyons, and then they do a numerical calculation of amounts that are taken from the head gates below that until it reaches zero. So in that theoretical sense, there becomes a zero point on the river or a zero point where there's virgin flow. Um, What's happened though oftentimes is that there will be what's considered a zero point on the river, i.e. no flow, but at that same time, you could go out there and physically see water in the stream. And so some of those are from irrigation return flows. Some of those are from lawn irrigation, uh, groundwater flows. Some of those are available for us to use municipally. Some of them we haven't changed. So um, what usually happens is after the runoff season, um, if we're trying to take water below the calculated zero point on the river, what we do, then do is we have what we refer to as our Peck Ditch Augmentation Station. And it's a place where we actually divert water out of the St. Brain Creek. We physically measure that flow, and then we return it down below Kind of down about Golden Ponds, and it's the measurement that we that we're able to record as physical water being delivered that we can then take some credit. And so it's kind of an integrated part of our system. But um, the zero point does come into effect often. Um, it usually comes into effect usually later in the season, probably around. It could be as early as July, but usually it's like August through October is where we're affected by that. Does that create a dry up above the Peck Ditch Og Station? Yes. So that again, there's a there's that theoretical zero point where you can't divert down below, but yet if we're still passing water through, if we, for example, during that period of time um, wanted to um, run water out of Button Rock down to Union, there could still be flows. We what we have to then do is measure those flows. Those flows through the augmentation station, then we get that credit. Because there used to be a gauging station at Golden Ponds. 
So if you were ever around Golden Ponds, there was a bridge that went over the um, St. Vrain Creek. If you looked immediately upstream, there was a place that there was a gating station, but that kind of got washed out and wasn't functioning 100% great. And the state did not want to re replace it. So we have a gauging station to hygiene. Our very next one is clear below our wastewater treatment plant. So a pretty big gap, if you will, in the river point. And so that's why they use this calculated zero point. Had we, we've tried to work with the state to maybe put in a, um, and replace that one at Golden Ponds um, to actually record flows. But now that we have the Peck Ditch Augmentation Station, it works better. It's, it's a newer augmentation station. We've used it a couple of years now, um, but with operational experience, it's, you know, it's, it's working pretty well for us, so. But it's off channel. So in order to get the quantification, you got to take it out of channel. Exactly. And it doesn't, from an outsider looking in, it makes no sense that you have to pull water out of the river in order to get credit. And we've spent years with discussions with the state on that. And that's what we had to do. Thank you for okay. my curiosity on that. I have a, two more questions, I'll be sure. Okay. Um, where does the 135% come from? So the 135%, it was, it's, it was uh, something that we looked at back, back when we started the water supply and drought management plans, you know, back after 2002. And the, the theory looked at knowing that you needed to be able to meet your current year demand, and you also need to be in a position to meet your future water year demand. And so we looked at, you know, if 100% was needed to be met for this year, um, there wasn't an exact science coming up with 135 versus some other number. It was based upon looking at what we would could reasonably expect from most years in terms of snowpack to look at what we would normally use at Button Rock. We looked at a whole bunch of different factors and it was believed that if we had 135% in a given year, um, we would then be feel relatively safe within a standard deviation or a certain confidence level to meet that year and the following year's demands. But we kind of grown it to say, we're not just going to look for 135% this year. We're also going to look for 135% or more next year. So we even kind of became more conservative in our approach. And, and, and that's kind of how, how we, how we got there. And um, last question, what, if any impact might a shortage declaration have on Longmont's water supply? So, so if we, if we declare, if I understand your correct, your, your question, um, if, if we were to declare a level one drought that we had a shortage, is, um, is that not what you're asking? No, I apologize. I meant for the, um, for Lake Mead. And oh, oh, okay. Yeah. For Lake Mead. So what you're, what you're talking about is that kind of that newspaper article that was, in the Denver Post and, and okay, I'm with you. You're talking to shortage declaration on the Colorado River by the Bureau of Reclamation. Right, um, would that affect our Trans Mountain at all? So um, it won't affect Longmont's yield necessarily this year because the quota has already been set by the board and that quota was based upon water that's already in storage. Where I, there could be an impact is as, as I read it, um, there was, uh, it was projected that maybe there could be a, uh, uh, a call on the river as early as June, that Lake Mead call would be below 1,075 feet. I think right now it's at 1,082 feet. So it's almost a hundred it's almost 147 feet, uh, below full. So it's, it's a, it's down a lot. And we understand that. Um, what it would do, what it potentially could do is require more CBT water to, to be required to be delivered um, out of the state. Um, what that would then do indirectly would affect possibly how much got into storage and future um, quota declarations by the board. 
but, and Todd might be able to help and Ken might be able to help me answer this. I believe even with a 70% quota that's already been determined for this year and a 50% for next year, which is relatively conservative, I think with what's currently in the CBT system and a reasonable expectation of what would get into our storage before June when, when they anticipate Lake Mead would kind of hit this critical piece that, that we're still sound in that. So that's, that's a lot to say, yes, it could impact us, but the way it would impact us is by the quota declaration in future years. I can add a little. Ken, you want to go first? Yeah, let me just the one point of clarification I would like to say is a shortage declaration by the Bureau of Reclamation on the Colorado River um, functionally affects the lower basin. In, in essence, um, depending on the level of Lake Mead, it reduces the amount of release from Lake Mead to the lower basins. It does not affect um, the upper basin because the upper basin by the inter, uh, interstate compact, Colorado River, River Compact, is required to provide 7.5 million acre feet per year or 75 million acre feet in 10 years, which honestly we've, we've exceeded that uh, by quite a bit over the years. And there's nothing to believe we wouldn't do that. Um, psychologically, it'll have a big impact. <laughs> Uh, it, it, it really will, it, you know, it, it'll, it'll start a lot more angst and concern, um, but, we're, but functionally, quite honestly, it will help. Uh, the lower basin states have been taking an excess amount of water out of Lake Mead, and it will, it will require, that, that'll stop during a shortage protocol. And so that, that won't hurt anything at all. Um, and, and the upper basin's actually been hurt a little bit by the equalization protocols between um, Lake Mead and Lake Powell. So a short, and a shortage declaration helps minimize that impact as well. So there's positives and negatives for the upper basin. We'll still be required to meet our interstate compact at least ferry of 7.5 million acre feet plus our half of the Colorado River Compact. I mean, the Mexican uh, uh, Compact, but but yeah, it's, it's, I think as big as anything else, it's a big psychological uh, shakeup <laughs> on everybody. And then, yeah, I'd, I'd welcome any more input, Todd. No, I think you did good there, Ken. I, I think my discussions um, on the Northern board is, um, you know, it's multiple years before there would be really an impact um, potentially to the upper basin and the CBT um, delivery or yield, I should say. And even then, I think there's a question as to if there was ultimately a compact call, how is that going to be done? And, and there's a 2026 renegotiation of the operating rules for the, the compact. And I think <laughs> this is all going to play out in that as well. So I don't view it, Allison, it's not likely going to have any real near-term impacts on the CBT yields based on my discussion with Northern staff. Um, but it, and I made the argument, I was supporting a 70% quota um, versus others were hoping for an 80%. And part of my rationale is that, that there's uncertainty long-term with that um, with the, the quota due to the impact or the issues on the low reservoir levels in Lake uh, Mead and Lake Powell. So I think long term, there's there's definite concern seeing the amount of drought that's gripping the, the southwest and the, I mean, there are at levels in Lake Mead and Powell that they haven't see, seen since they started filling those reservoirs. So I think we need to keep that in mind with the kind of operations going forward. But it doesn't have any real near-term implications in terms of the yield um, per the Northern staff. So anyway, hopefully that, that helps. Thanks, Are there guys. any other questions? Okay. Um, I don't see anybody else have any general questions about the, the recommendation. Um, 
by staff is that we um, uh, forward a sustainable drought conservation level as part of the 2021 water supply and drought management plan. Um, so I don't know if there's any further discussion. Otherwise, um, we'll need a motion to that effect um, if everybody's in agreement. I so move. Okay, we have a motion by Allison. Is there a second? I'll second it. We have a second by Roger. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carries. Thanks, Wes. Thank you. All right, we're on to item nine. Um, 9A is a sustainability and per capita use information. Um, Ken, are you heading this one up? Um, actually, I'll introduce. Um, thank you very much, uh, Chairman. Um, I have uh, Francie Jaffe's here today to, to present this information. We want to um, do two things. One, uh, Water Board had asked for some specific information on the per capita use, and Francie put a real good information together there, as well as um, kind of our annual update on the water conservation program in general. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to Francie to uh, present that information to you. Great, thank you, Ken. Um, Heather, can you pull up page 42 in the packet? I'll just walk through those different. So um, board, I just wanted to start um, with kind of an overview of our annual metered water consumption in acre feet um, from 2007. I just wanna highlight that you do see that jump in 2020 from 2019. Um, that's pro that jumps probably a lot higher with the combined with 2019 us having so much. I don't think people started turning on their sprinkler systems until July because there was so much water that year compared to last year, which was very different, much more drought conditions. Um, so, even, even with that jump, if we look at a five-year average, if we could do like 2007 to 2011 and then look at the past five years, um, there's still about a 6% average reduction in uh, cons water consumption. Um, I also wanna highlight that the, the larger increases, um, you saw increase in 2020 from 2019 was residentially, um, though it wasn't as high as our last drought year, which was 2012. Um, so you, we did have less consumption um, this in last year than to 2012. Um, I also want to highlight that our city water usage was our third lowest since 2007 and 2020. Um, and I think that's important to highlight because that highlights different upgrades our parks have been doing in the past five years uh, from moving from more to more from more from uh, treated water to raw water, also doing different irrigation upgrades. So I think that actually highlights some of the work that even last year with higher water usage, our city water usage was actually a, um, on not as high as previous years. Well, still higher than last year, but not as high as kind of the past uh, over 10 years. Next slide. So this is our uh, gross per capita per day. Um, so this is looking at, we take the water, the plant effluent, and then subtract out lines usage and then divide it by our service population. So we take our city of Longmont population, estimate we the amount of, we have a couple more, well, a little bit more than a couple external um, households that we estimate that residential population and that's our total service population. So again, you can see that jump from 2019 to 2020 uh, but it's still a downward trend from 2007. Again, that five-year average from 2007 to 2011, uh, or sorry, the five-year average in the past five years is about 141 uh, gallons per capita per day. Is our, that average with it being a little bit high this year at 145. And then that, that five-year average reduction from that 2007 to 2011 versus the past five years, it's about 17%. So the are so it shows a higher savings per person because of our in large increase in population, but the our water usage um, compared to our how our water usage is going down. So um, hopefully, I'm, I'm based on Wes's estimations, we'll probably see a similar 
or maybe a little bit higher water usage this year. And then, so if you can scroll down to the last, and this is our water conservation program update. So I know there's a lot happening on that left side of the screen. Um, so with our resource central programs, uh, they actually ran out of gardens last year. So we sold all our discounts, but total gardens sold in Longmont was actually lower. They had the same problem this year. They ran out of gardens, I think, in, in late March. So the, I think they, they weren't even, they were open for about a month before, or no, it was the first week of April. So they were open for just over a month before they ran out of gardens. Uh, last year, uh, with our WaterWise seminars, we actually had our second highest amount of participants. And that's, I think, pretty impressive because it was the first year we actually did webinars uh, due to COVID. So actually because of how, well, for multiple, with COVID still happening, but also how successful it is, we're doing webinars again this year. Um, we actually had that first webinar uh, that you can see that I estimated 103 were registered when I sent this over to Heather. Uh, since then, we've had the reserve registration, sorry, the webinar this year, and we had 76 people attend. I don't know um, how many of those, were. I usually, they'll tell me at the end of the season how many Longmont specific residents attend. So then we also had our, hot, last year, we had our highest number of people participating in Slow the Flow. So hopefully we can continue and have more people getting those irrigation assessments. Uh, we had not as great a year last year when it comes to toilet rebates, our sustainable business program grant. This was actually, they uh, got a, it was a number, it was a small grant to fully cover the cost of different indoor appliances. So there were four toilets. Um, and then if you actually look at the efficiency works, we only had six residential toilets uh, last year. I think that's a couple of reasons. It was a new pro, uh, we, we moved the program to efficiency works. It was stricter requirements. Uh, we, it was COVID. There's a lot happening. I think the fact that already, this is from Mar through March, um, we've had the same number of last year. That's a better idea that we'll have more people participating. We did some more outreach in April. So I'm hoping at the end of the month, I'll see also an uh, increase in the number of toilet rebates. Um, we actually had, a, I thought, a pretty good launch for our residential irrigation. Um, we had 101 different rebates from match, match precipitation rotor heads um, and rain sensors and uh, Wi-Fi irrigation controllers make up that 101. And then we had four different projects with multifamily and commercial, and we did not have any toilet and urinal rebates. Uh, we're still trying to figure out this year how to best engage the commercial multifamily uh, market. That's completely new for us. So we have, oh, we did, I just found out today that uh, the multifamily buildings are, have other, with all the snow happening, have some other priorities. So we're going to push them again, but we're really trying to be strategic and try to target those industries more this year. And then we're also hoping to bring on later this year, we're just waiting for final approval, more commercial rebates, especially, especially in the commercial kitchens. Um, so we can really offer more opportunities specifically for restaurants. So we'll be targeting restaurants more this year. So uh, lastly, we had some different projects. We, uh, I worked with Parks to, we received a grant to transition 1.25 acres to a water-wise turf. So hopefully by the end of this year, we'll see, we estimated 50% water savings. So we're hoping to see, see if that's accurate and then also work to create a more strategic plan next year for turf transitions. And then we also did a indoor fixer, fixture upgrade pilot with the St. Green Valley School District. We fully covered the costs. We wanted to do a large project so that we could create some case studies about, okay, if you fully replaced a large number of toilets and urinals, how many, how much savings would, would you get so that we can better target uh, more other schools, maybe some of our multifamily buildings. But unfortunately, we probably won't get some good data on those savings for a couple years because schools have been so virtual, um, on and off virtual. So um, I kind of jumped between 2020 and 2021 um, as I went down. Uh, so a lot of our, essentially most of our 2021 programs are still running except for Garden in the Box. 
And the last thing I want to highlight before any questions is that this year, uh, we actually offered a pilot program in Resource Central's Garden in a Box. We did an income qualified program. So Longmont has a program called CARES that is a kind of one-stop shop application for different rebates. So CARES participants this year could receive an 80% discount on their garden. So actually I have the number wrong. We actually had 52, not 51 income qualified gardens sold. I think it was a total of 38 participants. It's still in green because we didn't sell out all our discounts. So they have another fall sale that I think we have, we could sell maybe about 10 more gardens. So we're gonna push that. So I'm very excited to learn um, what went well with this program this year, um, how we can engage more of our income qualified community and get gardens out to more uh, individuals where cost has been prohibitive in the past. So that is my overview. Any questions? Roger, go ahead. Uh, can you go back to the chart before that, the per capita usage? Heather? Yeah, okay. My question, Francie, is what is our uh, objective on this particular measurement right now? I mean, what, where are we, what are we targeting? Yeah, uh, thank you for that question. So our current goal in our, uh, based on our raw water master plan, specifically focused on overall water usage. And I do not believe had a specific goal for gross per capita per day, um, but I'm sure based on overall water usage, we could es essentially in projected population come up with a target. Uh, Ken, I saw you. I'm yeah. Sorry. Um, Did your video? Thank you, Roger. Uh, that, that's an excellent question. So, Francie's absolutely correct. Originally, in our uh, raw water master plan, we set a goal of a 10% water savings at um, essentially build out what's called uh, planning horizon of the city. That's a 3,500 acre foot savings. Um, through a lot of people's efforts, Nelson's and Francie's primarily, over the years, we're really about there, and, and that's most excellent. We're very, very happy to be, to be very successful in that those efforts, um, which means that when we do our next water efficiency master plan update, um, we'll be able to engage with Water Board and have a serious conversation about um, looking at that um, savings goal and seeing if we can make it a slightly more aggressive uh, and increase the, the final um, water conservation effort and goals uh, for, for the planning horizon of the city. Um, so Francie's absolutely correct. We, we, our ultimate goal is to meet the 10% savings at, um, the, at the planning horizon. And, and, and we've really done that. And uh, thanks to her and Nelson's efforts. Yeah, but that, now you're still talking about total water usage, right? Not per capita. We're talking about the total water supply for the city. Um, that is correct. The total usage. You know, I, I guess my point is, and I, I think a measurement of usage per capita is a lot more relevant on what we're doing as individuals and just saying the total water usage. If you're not, if you're not figuring in or factoring in our population, I think that doesn't tell the whole story. And that, I'm just giving you my two cents worth. I, I, am, I would be much more favorable to watch per capita usage. I think it tells the story a lot clearer than total water usage. That's, that's just my opinion, Ken. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, in fact, normally many times when we do these graphs, we have the gross per capita line. And then below that, we'll have the uh, single family, multifamily, commercial, because each one of those, I agree, needs to be looked at individually. And yeah, for the single family, that's a real good indicator of what somebody in a single family home is doing for, for some of those other 
and it allows you to understand where you need to focus your water conservation. And we do have we do have those numbers, and we just we didn't want to overwhelm the the graphing right now. But but yeah, we're more than happy to have the conversations around those individual metrics as well. Yeah, maybe we can Good look point. at that look at that sometime down the road. So anyway. I told you how I feel about it. Hopefully we can uh, go from there. Cool, thank you. All right, thanks, Francie. Any other questions, comments? Francie, I got one, one question on your um, slide, the annual metered water consumption. You mentioned um, kind of lower demand for the city properties. Um, is This is just potable use, is that correct? So, I guess the point is, as you were saying that, you know, there's been conversion of parks and golf courses, let's say from potable to non-potable use. I guess my only question there is, you know, to the extent the park or whatever is using ditch rights that, you know, may be available either now or in the future to the city's potable system. And I guess I would say, you know, there may be water rights that we could integrate A or B with a pump back project. Um, I don't know. I, I just wonder, you know, they're, it's kind of that efficiency, how efficient are they being versus if they just go to, to irrigation water, um, that may, that supply may have another use long-term. And anyway, I was just kind of curious um, um, in terms of that measure of efficiency, how much of that is just switching supply versus, you know, hey, they're actually using less than what they maybe had historically. So I don't know if there's a, any numbers on that or if you guys have looked at that for the parks of just regardless whether it's irrigation water or potable water, how much are, are they actually reducing their use by a certain percentage? So Chair, I know um, kind of measuring raw water usage has been something that we're trying to improve a better way of tracking that I, I, I believe not ever that it that are there are still abilities to track it better so it's not something we have consistently tracked i know the parks over the past two years have been working to install some different ways to better track uh, i think three or four of their parks that use raw water usage to have a better understanding so we could I believe track total water usage for both raw and treated better at our parks. I think we've only recently had the technology to even do that at some of our parks. So I think there are more opportunities to do that, but I also know that our parks, um, we are like have explored different irrigation upgrades and are exploring doing different, not just the turf transition project I highlighted, but installing more water-wise plants. They actually install a garden in a box at two different locations. So I know they are exploring, but that is something we could explore better in the future. Well, I just think it'd probably just help tell the story a little bit more of, you know, they are being more efficient with their use rather than just a, maybe a transition of supplies is my only point. So. I, I think what you're doing, it'll, it'll play out that way. Francie, as you're suggesting, I was just kind of curious. Um, looks like, David, you have your hand, your virtual hand up. My virtual hand is up. Thank you, Chairman. Um, just real quick on that. That is a question that I've been asking my park staff as well. We, fortunately, it's a good cart in front of the horse. We started making some of these changes to our systems on how we could be more um, water conserve more water in our parks before we had a system in place to truly measure it. So unfortunately, we can't go back and probably make up that data. It's more of the idea that we know we've done better irrigation systems. We reduce the footprint of turf in our parks. Like Francis said, some of that comes in retrofitting. Also other pieces are coming in the, the design. We're designing a lot more um, native vegetation into our parks as well too. So it is gonna be unfortunately a missing part of the story where I wish you would have had the data to show that because now we're gonna start showing change from a point where we've already taken some of that low hanging fruit um, as we start incorporating this. But it is something we definitely wanna do a better job at, at trying to calculate our raw, raw water usage. Thanks for that input, David. I, I And I think that is the image for the rest of the city of, you know, the, the city's trying to be efficient with its use and 
xeric plants and you know that that even having that information going forward and maybe it's application rates over the you know over the areas but anyway i think that's great work that'll i think help the validity the conservation ethos within the entire community so i, I appreciate that that answer thank you um any other questions comments all right well we'll um keep moving thank you francie for that that was a good presentation thank you very much all right next item is um 9b which is a windy gap firming project update um ken you gonna give that uh yes thank you mr chair um just really a, a fairly quick update on the windy gap um we we are still negotiating a, a settlement on the federal lawsuit um I don't have anything, any result to report yet, but we're getting very, 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 very close. Um, and I, I don't want to jinx anything and, I, and I, I'm not able to <laughs> even say anything, but, but we believe we're close enough that there, we might even see some kind of a, uh, uh, information on that yet, even this week where that, it's that close, I think, uh, uh, that'll be great news if we move forward with it. Uh, but again, until, until every party in the case has, has uh, uh, signed on the dotted line, we're not done. But um, we had real good conversations with the contractor on how we move forward, have real good conversations. Um, I'm hearing good things coming out of, out of the legal team, as well as um, we're all taking a quick look at the financing. So I think we're getting uh, much closer than we are. And, and um, certainly as soon as we hear something, um, we'll inform the board as well because it will be big news and it'll come pretty quick. Um, and we certainly are hopeful that it, it's good news that you'll be hearing, hearing soon. And that's really about all I have right now, Todd. Okay. Are there any questions for Ken on that? It does not look like it. Okay. Thank you, Ken. Next item is um, 9C, a monthly legislative report. Looks like you're going again, Ken. Um, yes. And we have nothing to add. We do not have any bills that we're recommending uh, or asking for a recommendation. We're moving forward right now in the water arena. Seems like we've got a whole bunch on sustainability and, and electrical uh, our electric department's got a bunch they're looking at, but as far as water, we're we're kind of mostly just monitoring right now, so we don't have a real easy report this year, this month. Okay, thank you. So next item is 9D, a St. Brain Left Hand um, uh, Water Conservancy District Stream Management Plan Update. Yes, and uh, Water Board recently, you may recall, recently asked us to. Uh, uh, work with the uh, St. Rain and Left Hand Water Conservancy District to get an update on their stream management plan. Um, unfortunately, they had the staff member that was the project manager uh, resigned. <laughs> and so they, they had a little bit of a setback on the, on the scheduling on that, but um, they have replaced that position and they're hoping to start really moving forward um, I have talked with uh, Sean Cronin, the executive director, and he feels he can come back probably about July. He'll, they'll have been able to do enough work on it to come back with a, a report. So um, got Kevin on the, on the hook today to answer any questions if, there, if the board has any specific questions or need, he, he has a little more information than I would, but um, yeah, if there aren't any questions, we'll kind of hope for a, re, uh, a more complete report in in midsummer. Okay, thank you. Any questions there? Okay, um, <clears throat> looks like we're on to item nine e, uh, water resource engineering projects update. Jason, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yeah, so I just wanted to give the board a quick update on uh, two projects. Um, Button Rock Outlet repairs uh, are complete. Uh, Button Rock Outlet is now fully open. Um, or it's fully back in operation. And uh, we also installed uh, uh, a new flow meter up there on the 54 pipe and it's now um, transmitting to the state. And I believe the state's about to adopt that as their new um, 
measurement coming out of Button Rock and no longer using the uh, uh, the in in stream gate or the downstream gauge. Um, so that's good. We will have to go back in and do some touch up repairs to the outlet in the fall. Uh, but for now, the gate the gate's up and going. Um, it, it's minor stuff uh, for what needs to be done up there. Uh, the gate's not leaking. It's just uh, um, there's some touch up spots that we need to uh, smooth out a little bit just to prevent uh, um, scouring around uh, the gate seats and the seals. Um, the other project I wanted to give you a quick update on was the South St. Vrain pipeline uh, pump station project. We now have Smith and Loveless under contract to, uh, to construct and build us an in uh, below ground uh, pump station. And uh, they, as of last Thursday, we sent them the uh, award. They have a week to sign it, get it back to us. But uh, um, all the negotiations are done and that project should be starting to move forward. Um, we'll do everything we can to make up for lost time, but chances are um, we're looking at probably the earliest that the pump station will be in operation would be January or February of next year. So a little less than a year out, but uh, still a few months behind our uh, original schedule. And uh, I'll also be working with uh, uh, some city staff on asking FEMA for an extension because we're using FEMA PAP funding to purchase this equipment. And uh, we're going to need an extension to get that, but uh, we don't think that'll be an issue, and we don't think the the funding's in jeopardy. But we're going to start asking for that extension now. So, if there's any questions? Any questions for Jason on his report? I don't see any. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. All right, item 10, um, 10A is a review of major project listings and items tentatively scheduled for future board meetings. Um, does any of the board members have anything they'd like to, to bring up on that? I, I do have one item I was just curious of. Um, Ken, we, we had talked, I think, you know, it was part of the Windy Gap firming um, discussions about talking to Excel Energy um, about the trade agreement that we have with them and making that permanent rather than, you know, we have, albeit it's a long-term, it's not a permanent agreement. Have you had any conversations with them or where, where is that at? Or is that maybe something you can address at a future board meeting? I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I, I would like to hear on that. No, that's fine. Um, actually, we have had conversations with um, water resources staff at XL Energy and they are, um, interested in receiving uh, and would be receptive receiving uh, uh, an offer, uh, you know, an updated um, offer for a, for the contract. Um, we've actually prepared one, and I have it um, in review by uh, the department's leadership team. And as soon as I get input back from them, we'll be able to forward that on to Excel Energy. And uh, so I, I hope that that will move forward. Okay. Uh, at some time in the near future. When it does, we'll, I'll get you that information. Awesome. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, okay, so we're on to item 11, which is in informational items and water board correspondence. Um, I think the only thing that was in the packet was, um, oh, I guess, a, a appreciation from the city of the volunteers and the, the water board. So thank you all for your, your service to the city. Um, I don't know if there's any questions, comments on, on those items that were in the packet. I don't see any. Um, item 12 is items tentatively scheduled for future board meetings. Looks like we'll have the cash and lieu review again in June. Um, I don't, is there anything else there, Ken, we need to be aware of? Um, I don't have anything else, no, thank you. Okay, all right, anything else for the good of the order? Um, otherwise, I'll. <laughs> go outside and watch it snow so start shoveling so thank you all and we'll um uh, the next meeting date just for everybody's calendars is may 17th so we'll we'll see you guys then thank you um, thanks during the meeting thank you all <laughs>